Uh, my name is Piotr Usakowski, and today I'd like to tell you about combining the power of Apache Spark and IPython notebooks to create a system for cooperative data exploration. So, first of all, let me give you some background on my company, DeepSense.io. Uh, we, this is a company that centers its business around machine learning. Uh, we offer services workshops in that area, and uh, you might say that Spark holds a special place in our hearts, and this is one of the reasons that uh, we've created Seahorse, uh, which is a visual way to create Apache Spark applications. Um, why am I telling you this? Because during the process of, of building, this, uh, building Seahorse, we've encountered several challenges, and after solving them, the solutions to those challenges turned out to form a, something interesting, something we didn't anticipate. And since we think it's cool, I'm here to share it with you today. Okay, so why do we even consider cooperative data exploration? What's the, what's the reason behind it? Well, first of all, the, the first answer is pretty obvious. Uh, when someone on the, discover, on, the, on the team of data scientists or data explorers makes a discovery about the data, has some insights. When they share it with the rest of the team, it's obviously beneficial, right? Uh, so that was the obvious one. The, the less obvious part is that when you're exploring a data set, uh, you probably want to store it in RAM as much as possible. Uh, because, well, it's quick. You don't want to wait two hours for your query to finish. Instead, you'd like it to be five minutes. And uh, this is where Spark comes in. It's really good with in-memory operations. And so when, when an entire team is exploring the same data set, there's actually no reason for this data set to be replica replicated across the cluster multiple times there should be a single instance of it, immutable, and everyone could be, should be able to, to use it, to explore it. So this way, we reduce the, the demand on, the, on, the, on this demand for resources, for, for memory in this case. And circling back to the first part, the, the obvious part uh, about sharing the insight, um, when, we, when, when this person has uh, this insight or uh, makes this discovery, uh, perhaps there's a way to transform the data in, in a way that could make this discovery uh, more useful, that, uh, that would expose this uh, interesting part about the data to, to everyone in a, in a better way. So this transformation of data is not cheap. It can take up a lot of time, a lot of CPU processing power. So again, we're saving resources, CPU this time. And this is, well, this is quite important, I think. Uh, just a second. <laughs> so uh, when, when sharing results or data sets, we are saving time and money, really. But, uh, okay, so after we have this motivation, how can we actually do it? Um, first of all, we are going to use Spark as our backend. For those of you who don't know what Spark is, haven't met it before, uh, it's a generic cluster computation platform. Uh, so basically, you run your application on thousands of nodes, and the scale is really, really, really well. And uh, it is open source. It has APIs in Java, Scala, R, and Python, which is the most important for part for this talk. And uh, well, Spark is cool. And so we will use this as our backend here, and as our frontend as the, the part that faces the user, uh, as you may have guessed from the title of this talk, we will use IPython notebooks. And again, if you're not familiar with them, they are kind of um, Spark interpreters on steroids. 
they can display images, render markdown, and of course uh, execute user's code, which is pretty important. Um, so since they are pretty widely used in the data science community and, uh, and in the data exploration business, uh, they will be a familiar front-end for, for users to, to this system. So, what are the problems here uh, that we are facing? What are the blockers? What's not ready out of the box? Well, we've isolated two things, mostly. First of all, how do we use a SQL context and Spark context of a running Spark application? SQL context and Spark context are sort of gateways to Spark functionality. Uh, I won't go into the details right now, but uh, it is important for us to be, ex to be able to access them from Python in order to, uh, to explore the data sets that are already present in Spark's memory. And the second part uh, of our challenge is to execute the code that user writes on the cluster. It is important to us because, first of all, a notebook server, which is where the computation for notebooks usually takes place, is not a computation node. It shouldn't be. Second, there are, uh, it shouldn't handle user's permissions. This is, this is the work of a, of a cluster, right? And uh, third, Spark uh, has some limitations currently. They might be removed in the future, but currently uh, some of the Python commands that interface with Spark applications needs to be, need to be executed on the same node that the driver of the Spark program, which is the, the main node for your application, is running. Okay, so there are two challenges and and the answer is composed of two parts as well. And the first part begins with Pi4j. A Pi4j, Pi4j is a, a set of two libraries, one for Python and one for Java, uh, which together allow to interface programs written in Python and Java. For example, when you have a, some, some important logic written in Java, let's say, adding integers, it's a pretty tough one. Uh, and you have a Python application that, where you want to reuse this logic. It can be achieved, for example, through creating a REST API uh, in the Java application, calling it from Python and retrieving the results. It's one way and it's okay. Another way is to use Py4j, um, which which from the Python side seems that, like creating an object and running a method on it. So it's quite familiar. That's exactly what you would do without Py4j and if you rewrite this, this entire uh, logic in Python. Uh, what is required on the Java side, on the other hand, is creating a gateway server. It's basically a server that, uh, that uses some custom TCP protocol uh, and, and exposes the JVM internals in a way uh, for Python clients called Java gateways to access. So, yeah, that, that's what Py4j looks like. And uh, how, do we, how do we use Py4j in our case? How can we expose our Python context, uh, for, sorry, uh, Spark context and SQL context of our running application uh, using Py4j. Well, I've told you that you can create objects uh, with Py4j on the JVM side, but what I haven't told you is that you can access already existing objects on the JVM uh, because Py4j exposes uh, this functionality of an entry point. Uh, so when you are creating uh, a, Java, a gateway server on the, on the Java side, 
you pass an object to it and it's immediately accessible for Python clients. And this object can be in itself sort of a gateway to, to the state of an application. So you immediately have access to, for example, Spark context and SQL context. Uh, if this object that you pass, this entry point, contains some getters, for example, or fields simply, that, uh, that have these, these two objects that we're interested in. And uh, and after we've been able to expose those two objects, all we need to do is create Python clients that can connect to, to this gateway server on Java side. And before the notebook is even fully loaded, we can run some scripts that set up this environment and inject these two variables, Spark context and SQL context, into, into users' context, into users' environment, so that they can use it immediately after, after starting notebook. And this answers, this part answers the, the first of our questions. So we now have access to a running Spark application. We can run code that interfaces directly with, with the Spark application that is running all the time. Okay, so time for answering our second question, and that is uh, how to execute a code on a cluster. And before I tell you about this, I, I'd like to tell you a bit about how notebooks are uh, architecturally created. Uh, and it begins with, well, notebooks first began uh, as only supporting Python, hence the IPython name. But uh, people who were using other languages quickly realized that this way of interacting with a language is pretty nice and wanted uh, this experience for themselves. Uh, and so IPython soon began to support languages like Lua, Scala, uh, Go. There are actually, I don't know, 15 of them right now, something about that, something around that. And so people began to wonder why is it even called an IPython notebook. And around a year ago, I think it was announced uh, a year ago without two days, uh, the so-called big split into this language agnostic part, which is called currently Jupyter Notebook. And this part that handles the Python side. So, this split pretty much describes the notebook architecture. There is a server that, that offers a REST API. Uh, you can tell it to spawn a new notebook. And after you've, you, as the user, have told it to spawn a new notebook, it creates a new process, which is called a kernel. And this process is related directly to, to the language you're writing in, and in our case, this is Python. So, after we've, well, researched it a bit, uh, we were pretty sure that we want to create some custom kernel, and, uh, and it, uh, well, it would still execute Python code, but, uh, but it would, have some modifications so, so that it can do what we wanted it to do. And those requirements that we, uh, that we imposed on it was that, first of all, uh, the user code should be executed on the cluster, so remotely in, uh, in relation to the notebook server. Right? So usually when the notebook server starts a kernel, it starts it right there on the same host. So we wanted the code to be executed on a completely different host and different enough that it shouldn't even have to be visible from notebook server because, no, uh, because Spark clusters can be placed in some completely other network. Uh, they, the, the Spark driver can be uh, on one of thousands of nodes and uh, it those nodes don't have all external IP addresses. They 
shouldn't have to be visible from some notebook server uh, just because. So we've devised a solution that looks like this. Uh, only there is more, co more code. And there are actually three parts, three important parts of this, of this solution. Uh, I'm not counting the, the user's browser. And the first part is here. It's forwarding kernel. Uh, this is what, what the notebook server thinks it's, is executing the code. So when a notebook server is asked for a new notebook, it spawns a forwarding kernel. That's our name, and I hope it will become clear uh, why, why we named it this way after I explain what it does. And the notebook, the, the forwarding kernel doesn't actually execute any code. Instead, it gathers all the traffic that, that comes from notebook server and sends it to a message queue, which is the second part of our uh, of our solution. We used uh, RabbitMQ as our message queue, but honestly it can be any message queue and uh, really it doesn't even have to be that. It can be uh, just any piece of software that can relay messages between two interlocutors. So this is pretty generic. And okay, so what the forwarding kernel does is it passes all the commands from the notebook server, like heartbeats, like request for code execution, like request for restart shutdowns, through this message queue, and they come out the other side and are received by our second interesting component called executing kernel. This one, when you look at it from afar, it just executes the code, it returns the results again via message queue, but when you look at it a bit closer, it actually acts as another forwarder. It receives those messages from message queue and sends them to an actual IPython kernel that it has started inside it. So, many forwarders here. And, uh, well, it works. <laughs> uh, so, what else can I tell you about this? Yeah, it can it can run anywhere, okay. uh, as can the message queue. The only uh, the only requirement is that the message queue is visible from both the notebook server and the cluster. And yeah. And so that, me that message queue there is typically what in an existing POC environment. That you well, as I've said, we we've used RabbitMQ, but this can be really this can be anything. Uh, anything that can pass messages. Uh, we've used RabbitMQ because we, we've already worked with it before and we like it. Um, okay, so now we've managed to solve the second one of our problems. Uh, we can now both execute code remotely and we can uh, access the, the state, the Spark context of a running Spark application. So, all that's left to do is to implement some form of interaction between the users. And, uh, well, this is really an open subject. This, since you have a base for that system, there's really, there are really many, many possibilities. And right now I'm only going to tell you about a, a simple, a simplest actually one, uh, so that the interaction occurs through a storage object on this uh, Spark application, in this Spark application. In the simplest form, it's just a map uh, with an ID mapping to a data frame, for example. Uh, but we can store anything in there, from models to, to code snippets. And uh, it's, well, first of all, it's fast. It can be access, accessed from any Python notebook that's connected to this cluster, and uh, <laughs> usable. And is everything being stored and shared here? Is it all Spark in memory, or does it transition between normal storage and in memory? 
Well, uh, we think of it that way so that uh, the data to be explored uh, efficiently, it should be in memory. So the first step uh, in the exploration should be loading the data into memory and only then it should be cached and explored further. Uh, so when you save a data frame to a storage, it's in memory. Yeah. Uh, although you can write it, of course, to some ex external storage if you like. There's no problem with that. And some other thoughts that can further this solution would be access control. For example, I might want to share, uh, share my results, my models, only with selected few colleagues, or uh, perhaps I just want uh, storage for myself for later as a cache. Uh, or maybe notifications. Hey, someone shared something interesting, perhaps you'd like to see it. And, well, that's, that, these are only some random ideas. I think there, there, can, there can be more. And uh, finally, I wanted to show an example of how we think this exploration process might look like. So, first of all, someone makes a discovery, creates something interesting, and wants to share it. This something, let's say it's a data frame, uh, some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, data set is being stored in, in the storage object. Uh, that is also, sorry, I didn't mention that, that should be also exposed via this entry point of ours that exposes Spark context and SQL context. So th this way anyone can access it. And uh, after this has been shared, someone else can explore it, someone else can base their, mod their research on it, uh, create models, and again, these models could be shared with the rest of the team. Yeah, and that's pretty much it. <laughs> I've persisted in memory, these models and sharing. Yeah, why not? Yeah. In memory, or of course, can be saved. There's no problem in that. Is this, are, are you going to show us an offering now? Like what, is, is this all uh, sort of bundled up together in something that I like, can navigate and see? And no, not yet. We are thinking about uh, creating an open source bundle, but uh, not yet. This is not, uh, this is just. What I'm showing you here is a, an idea. So it's a conceptual framework is where you're trying to uh, Yeah, but it's been implemented and it, it works. It, okay. Yeah. And so when you say it works, what are you sharing it by? Like how, how is Alex exploring it? How is Susan basing her models on it? Or is this the concept that you're trying to say? Okay, so when... How, how do we share models? Well, the exactly same way that we share data sets, data frames. We can just save it in memory and anyone can use them. Uh, so the, the, they are basically Spark transformers. So you just uh, use this object to transform a data frame. And it's the same with data sets. Uh, yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Do you have any more questions? Sorry, sorry, again. Yes, please. several users are working on the same time, on the same kernel. They are compete, uh, competing about CPU resources when they are doing the calculations. They are not uh, working on the same uh, kernel, although the, the kernels for each of them run on the same host. Uh, so, yeah, they are competing for CPU, but I think that uh, when you're using Spark, uh, the driver shouldn't be that much, uh, shouldn't do that much heavy lifting. The, the computations are spread uh, over the entire cluster. That's the entire idea for Spark. So, yeah, when you do a while loop, uh, then you will, uh, then this will be a bottleneck, bottleneck but, uh, but no, in real use cases, I don't think so. Yes, thank you. Yes. And who starts the application? I mean, how do you handle that, you know, that the application is shut, shut down? Or, uh, well, I think 
the applications don't just shut down by themselves. If they are designed to, to run for a long time, and they can be, uh, then they are being shut down when, uh, when the user wants them to be shut down, or when the entire cluster goes down, but that's unlikely. You can persist it at any time, actually, when just just write a data frame or a model to, to, to some storage, HDFS, for example. Uh, but no, this is uh, the idea behind it is uh, an easy way to, 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 to explore data. So in, a, in order to explore data, you need to have it in memory. The speed. You, when, when you are writing something down to disk, it takes time. In, in case of models, you're right. It's like that. But when you have a big data set, then it takes time. Well, it can be achieved, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, no, we haven't worked on that. Yes. Is, is there any uh, so? Isn't there any problem with uh, I don't know name collisions or if let's say if the team grows to too many people? Yeah, uh, there definitely can be, but this is easily solvable by some uh, I don't know perhaps a notebook owner. You just start by setting up your name and uh, then you have a namespace for yourself. Uh, yeah. So, or or you just create. Uh, for each uh, ID, a uh, unique ID. That's also uh, another solution. And, so, but, but, and this solution, you would say, could then scale to many people, like more than 10, 20, or, or do you think, yeah, since there's no... I think there, there is no, no real limit. Well, okay, this... Uh, there, there is a limit because uh, all the kernels run on the driver, but they, as I've said, they shouldn't do any heavy lifting, so this, this limit should be pretty high. In real, in real, ta uh, in real world scenarios, I don't think that uh, teams exploring a single data set are that big. Yeah, definitely, but... Uh, uh, no, uh, well, I think this should be um, limited. Well, okay, so a single Spark application should be shared between uh, members of a team. That's how I envision it. Uh, when you, because basically what you want to share is data. So when you want to work on the same data, there is a reason for sharing it. And when these are two completely different data sets, why bother? <laughs> I don't have my laptop with me, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sure uh, this will come up on our blog soon. Uh, I think that when you work on a project, you can just start with, okay, you're, you're starting with a data set. You, you start your application, you load the data set into memory, and when you're done with the project, you can shut it down. Uh, well, if your concern is that you're taking up resources uh, that can be used when your team is sleeping and uh, a team from another side of the world uh, can use this cluster in this time. Uh, yes, this, it can be uh, done alternatively, perhaps, 
uh, this can be <coughs> preloaded an hour before you come to work. Uh, this, well, this is, I, I don't really see a problem here, uh, sorry. I'm just, I'm just trying to imagine the communication and the way that I mean, multiple people work on, on one project and sharing objects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Did you have any experience about uh, No, we didn't. Uh, as I've said, this was created as a sort of side effect for, uh, for our, actual, our uh, actual work with Seahorse, uh, where we actually do have a long-running Spark application uh, that works in the background. Uh, but uh, for now, we don't support uh, cooperation in there between multiple users. Yes? Could you give an example of how long can it take to load data from HDFS into memory? Because you mentioned it can take up to several hours. Yeah, well, no, I can't give you numbers really, but uh, yeah, when the data is big, it's uh, t tens of gigabytes, it, it takes time. Okay, anyone else? Do you address any questions of data security in this regard? Uh, honestly, I haven't addressed any, but uh, when you connect, the, the only network communication comes here through this message queue, and this can be secure as you like, as secure as you like. So, mm, yeah, this is SSL and, uh, and some authorization methods. Don't think there's a problem there. Pretty much uh, near the, the the notebook server, I think, because this is something outside of the cluster, and both of them actually are outside of the cluster, so there's no reason to not to put them one near the other. Right. So you wouldn't put it in the cluster. You put it beside. No, no, no. Yeah. Okay. So, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>